If you are looking to get into micro soldering in the electronics world, then this is the right video for you. Welcome back to another Mobile Centrics Tips and Tricks. My name is Derek, and today we are going to be going over all of the basics that you need to get into micro soldering from the most basic levels to the more advanced. Let's get into the video. So the first thing that I'm going to go over are the tools that you need to get started. The first thing that you're going to need is, of course, a soldering iron. Now, it doesn't have to be one of the high-end fancy soldering irons. Almost any soldering iron will work. And once you've mastered soldering with a cheaper iron and you found it to be beneficial for you, investing in something that is a higher-end soldering iron will, will not only allow you to perform the jobs that you're doing with higher consistency, but it'll also leave you with better results. And of course, paired with the soldering iron, you need solder itself. There are basically two styles of solder. There's lead-free and leaded solder. Leaded solder isn't something that you'd see manufacturers using too much due to the health risks of using it. However, leaded solder makes jobs easier to work with. Now, there are other alternatives than using leaded solder. As technology has advanced, there are new forms of solder that allow you to achieve the same benefits that leaded solder has, which makes the jobs easier with the different temperature ranges of solder. So you'll notice when you start to look into solder, you have low melt solder, which helps desolder components and the application of new components. In a variety of cases, you have different temperatures of solder, like 138, 148, 158, 183, 217, all of these different temperatures to where the solder will melt under that environment. And you will find specific instances where one solder is better than the other. But let's start with the most basic of solder jobs, which is going to be charging ports. The most common charge ports that require soldering in the realm of Apple is going to be the iPads. Now, all of the charging ports in Apple products can be soldered. Some of them, it might be easier to replace the flux cable itself, say on an iPhone. But at the same time, replacing only the charge port on those flex cables, as I demonstrate in a video right here, not only can save you money, but it maintains the originality of the part to that particular phone. And I get more into it in that video that I linked there. There are some more nuances that come with doing those types of repairs because micro soldering always requires a certain amount of finesse and meticulousness that not everybody is cut out for. Probably the biggest area where soldering is most needed is on the iPads. And here are the different products that you will need apart from the soldering iron and the solder itself. And that's going to be flux, wick, a cleaning brush, microfiber cloths, isopropyl alcohol, or other flux cleaners. To assist in the repair or even protect the repairs, you may need captain tape and potentially, depending on what you're doing, solder UV mask. Now let me go over what those are. Flux is designed to act as a shield to clean and prevent oxidation from occurring while the solder is at its melting temperature. As solder is exposed to oxygen, it starts to oxidize, and to prevent that oxidation from occurring, flux is required. And one of the side effects of that is it helps the solder flow between surfaces that it that it will stick to. That's what allows you to get a nice solid joint between a pin and a pad, or a through-hold pad on a flex cable and the corresponding pad on a logic board below. Flux becomes your best friend when soldering, and there are several different types of flux. Some are thinner, some are thicker. Some get tacky, some don't. Some are easy to clean, some are harder to clean. Some are considered no clean flux and others aren't. And over time, as you use the different fluxes that you purchase, you will find out which one that you prefer to use. I'll have links in the description to all of the different products that I recommend and that I use on a day-to-day -day basis for the repairs that I do. The next thing that I mentioned was wick. Now wick acts like a sponge paired with flux it'll easily absorb the solder that is liquefied. 
Some logic boards have a higher thermal mass behind them, which means that they're going to suck away the heat from the area that you're soldering much quicker than a thin logic board or a flex cable, which means that additional heat might be needed or a low melt solder may need to be added to the solder that's existing on that logic board to help lower the overall temperature that it needs to get to to be absorbed by the wick by kind of mixing the two solders together. It might be that there is a lead free high temperature like a 217 melting, melting point solder there. So adding a 138 to it and mixing it up by flowing them together with a soldering iron will then help you when you wick it, which consists of a couple different methods, either applying pressure with a soldering iron or a heat source like a rework station. In both scenarios, good technique involves never removing the wick without the heat source present. If you remove the heat source and the wick is still touching a pad, it may end up pulling that pad because it'll get stuck the minute the heat goes away, the solder cools down, and you're stuck with a wick on the board. So making sure that you pull away the wick with the heating source or even before the heating source is something that will come with experience. And having a good brush with clean room wipes and isopropyl alcohol or other flux cleaners like the Falcon 530 or a flux cleaner itself will allow you to prep the area for a new component, clean away burnt flux, and is useful throughout the entire process. Now you'll find the longer you leave flux on a logic board and the more you work with it, the harder it's going to be to remove. And so you'll find this balance of cleaning the flux, adding new flux, cleaning the flux, adding new flux throughout the entire process because flux is your friend, but you have to treat it with care. And of course, one of the more important things is to know the different types of solder that you're using and their purposes. Because if you're working on a component that is going to see action, like a connector, where a connector is going to be popped off and, and, and put back, using a lower melting solder will not be suitable for this because it is a weaker solder and it will not withstand all of that wear and tear. Whereas a smaller IC chip, for example, will like a lower melting solder because it'll be easier for you to apply it. For example, a TriStar IC, a very common component to replace on Apple products, as it's basically the first line of defense for the charging circuit. And so having something like a TriStar tester to determine whether it's the culprit when you have a device that isn't charging is something that I heavily recommend. But being able to desolder an IC chip and replace it with an IC chip that you have reballed with a 138 after prepping and cleaning the logic board Putting that back with a lower melting solder is going to be so much easier than trying to do it with either the factory solder or a higher melting solder. And there's less risk involved because overall, the more heat that you apply to a logic board, especially on Apple products where they have underfill under some of the more important BGA chips, you will see a world of difference when you understand the different types of solders that you use. And the last thing in this video I wanna to touch on is preparation for the new components. It is vital that you prepare the components that you're going to solder on to have a smooth and successful repair. And one of the things that you'll note is having uniformity across the components, whether it's applying new solder to a row of pads or ensuring that the BGA the ball grid array chip that you are reballing has uniform solder balls across its grid so that things go smoothly in the actual repair. So if you're a tech that's been questioning whether or not it's worth it to getting into soldering, it definitely is. And it's not as hard as you think, especially as you start with the most basics and you start working your way up, you'll build the skills that you may currently think are impossible for you to acquire. You may look at separating a sandwich board on an iPhone as something that is so complicated that it's only in your wildest dreams, but you will find that given a little bit of time and investment into yourself and educating yourself in these areas, that it becomes just another repair. I'm sure you remember taking off your first screen or replacing your first battery or charging port and the nerves that you may have had in doing so. And just like the nerves went away in those repairs over time, the same is said for getting into the soldering world. Leave any comments or questions that you have 
down below. Hopefully this video has helped you become a little bit more confident into stepping into this realm of the tech world. Thanks a ton for watching. We'll see you in the next video.